Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Friday, February 11th edition of the Basement Academy. Our morning psalm is one of my favorites. It is a short little psalm, just three verses. And it is one of the pilgrim psalms as they're journeying up to Jerusalem, so appropriate. And we'll be talking about pilgrimage as one of the spiritual disciplines. So as we think of ourselves as pilgrims on the way. Psalm 131. My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. Mm. Sweet picture, not concerning ourselves with, we can't figure everything out, Lord. But we are going to be at rest with you like a child uh, sitting in his parents' kind of with, with mother, <clears throat> uh, stilling and quieting our souls. Do we have that capacity or do you, do you have that ability? Have you cultivated that in the midst of all of the stuff that goes on in our world, in your little world, you know, kind of the circle where you live and your heart gets overwhelmed? Have you learned how to I have stilled and quieted my soul. I will rest in you, O Lord, when I don't understand all these things that are far beyond me. I will be at peace and rest with you. That just doesn't happen. We have to work at that. And that's what these spiritual disciplines are are about. They're they're part of. And so uh, yesterday talking about the disciplines that Dallas Willard identifies in his book, The Spirit of the Disciplines. The Disciplines of Abstinence, helping helping us to uproot the sins of commission, the things that we're doing that we need to stop doing. And then the Disciplines of Engagement that help us to uproot the sins of omission, things that we need to start doing that we may not be doing. The notion of the abstinence creating space for engagement and so there's some I think there's some uh, nice symmetries that are at work there but there's something about the disciplines that help us to still and quiet our souls they um, it's usually our emotions right it's our emotions get the best of us. Our feelings overwhelm us, be it anger, frustration, anxiety, disappointment, discouragement, just that the, the host of, uh, if you think of our uh, emotions like a, a painter's palette, you've got the, you know, the primaries, the blues, the reds, the, uh, the yellows, and then everything that comes from those, right? And, and, and yet there's also darker shades that we paint with, right? And, and so usually we get overwhelmed by the darker emotions. That's usually what distresses us um, when we can't keep them reined in. And so would that life was all, you know, yellow, red, and blue. Um, but life is not that. Certainly not life east of Eden. And so these disciplines help us. They, they shape us. They train us. They, they discipline us. They, they train us. I mean, discipline is really correction. It's training. It's it's focusing the child. When we're disciplining the child, we're trying to help them understand and and realize there's a larger world. It's not all about you. And so we train the child. We discipline the child. You know, we teach them how to live in community, to how to be in our family, how to do your work, how to be responsible, how to contribute, and then how to control your emotions. So these these disciplines are, are I think, are like that. There is a word that you can probably see at the heart of the word discipline, and it's the word disciple. Disciples of Jesus have been disciplined, are disciplined. 
It doesn't just mean a follower, but there's a real meaning to the word disciple. It's one who is taught, is one who is trained. We've talked in the past about being apprentices of Jesus. Discipleship is a word that, you know, maybe doesn't have the same um, traction in our society, in our vocabulary. But an apprentice, one who learns the craft, learns the skill, learns the trade, from the inside out. It takes time. There's growth. There's a body of knowledge and skill to master. And then over time, that that thing begins to indwell you. And then the, the, the apprentice, the one who grows into the, um, with, with great skill, um, grows into one of, of excellence and ability to engage the craft with, with depth and maturity. So it is with the, the life of Christ. So two other um, folks that I'm aware of that, that speak of the, the disciplines, uh, Richard Foster, um, his book, The Celebration of Discipline. I can't find my copy. Uh, one of our, <laughs> uh, one of our uh, community here, Basement Academy community, one of our members of Greenwich is going to lend me their copy for my reading. But this is what, I've got this written from some previous notes. <clears throat> Foster talks about the inward disciplines, the outward disciplines, and then the corporate disciplines that we engage together. The inward disciplines of meditation. <clears throat> so m not just reading the word, but meditating. This is not Eastern meditation. This is not yoga. This is not you know Hindu meditation, Buddhist meditation. It is not an emptying of oneself, you know, focusing on a word and, you know, saying a mantra. It is not, it is not that. Meditating upon the word is, um, is to, to read that word, to hear that word, to, to, to understand that word in context. Um, we're going to come down here. I'll, well, I'll, I'll talk about, about that later with Eugene Peterson, how he speaks of it. Um, the word meditate also is used of the animal, the, the cow that chews the cud. It is to take that, it is to take that word and to play with it, to sit with it. Okay? So meditation of the word, not just reading the word, not just hearing the word, but but not just studying, but meditation. So meditation, prayer, we've spoken of, fasting, again, we've spoken of that, and then study. So study for knowledge and Understand how this word connects to that word, how this story connects to that story. Again, the trees, the forest and the trees that we've talked about. Study will lead us to that. But meditation is to let that word kind of set in. So the inward disciplines, the outward disciplines of simplicity, okay? So similar to frugality that, that Dallas Willard talks about. So thinking about... You know, we don't have to spend all the money. We don't have to go all out. If we want to entertain, we don't have to, uh, you know, just simplicity is we're going to be with our friends. We practice the simplicity, how I adorn myself, how I dress, how I decorate, how I, how I speak with others. You know, we don't, everything doesn't have to be elaborate, which sometimes can draw attention to ourselves. We love the praise sometimes when, you know, we go all out. People go, man, you went all out. And so let there be simplicity, okay? So there's something about that. Uh, solitude, we've spoken of being, choosing to be alone. So it's, a, it's an outward discipline in that I have a way of withdrawing. I can even, I can experience solitude even in the midst of a crowd. I can just, you know, just mentally, emotionally, spiritually step back and just be here and attentive to God. Is there somebody here at this gathering that you would want me to go speak with, Lord. I'm going to, so it's kind of that solitude of recognizing I'm apart from the group. I'm in the group, but at this moment, I am apart from this. I am alone with my thoughts. I'm alone with God. So, But typically, it is pulling aside uh, from uh, community. Uh, submission, we've spoken of that uh, and the difficulty uh, of that, submitting ourselves to one another. And so typically that's an, an outward thing, right? That you have to be engaged with someone. Uh, service, uh, we've spoken of that, giving ourselves to others. The corporate 
disciplines then that we do together, confession of our sins. Uh, we do this uh, in worship, worship itself, right? So the gathering, so, so Foster, like Dallas Willard, identifies worship as a discipline. That when you go to church, you're not just going to church, you're going to worship. You're going to be in the presence of God with the people of God. And so I think I haven't spoken of this recently, but you know, when we go to worship, there is an audience, but it is not us. That the tendency is to think that the minister, the choir, uh, the you know, the, the the bell choir, you know, the person up there speaking or singing or whatever, that they're the performers and we, the congregation, are the audience. No, no, no. There's an audience of one. And worship understands that. So the minister, the preacher, the, the, the worship assistant, the choir, these are like the conductors. They're, they're helping the congregation really who are the performers, so to speak. I don't mean that in the, you know, we're performing in worship, but we are worshiping God. God is the audience of one. So worship is a collective discipline that we gather together corporately uh, as a people and lift our praise, uh, our song, uh, our, our prayers. Um, guidance, okay, so, so Foster introduces the, the discipline of guidance. How we, along with others, discern a direction, a purpose, a goal, an action. Churches engage in this all the time, right? I mean, families certainly do. Um, uh, but but churches certainly do this in terms of you know when we're, we're we're in the search for a director of family ministries and so there's a discernment that happens what are the needs what are the requirements to meet that need we sketch that out mission uh, and ministry opportunities are often that way and so corporately we work together the building project uh, that we engaged in oh that was such an, a long project but we discerned together. There's proposals that are put out there. We pray, we seek feedback, all of this. We're, we ask you know, God to reveal his word to us and, and guide us. Uh, and then celebration, we, we've spoken of, of that as well. So confession, worship, guidance, celebration. So these 12 uh, disciplines. And, and I like the way Foster speaks of it. The book is celebration of discipline. Discipline is like, oh, groan. I've got to do this stuff, you know, and somebody's, you know, the pastor, Pastor Don is out there, you know, whipping people, you know, say your prayers and go meditate on your Bibles and, you know, confess your sins. It's not, it's not a slog. This is something we celebrate because we are subduing our unruly hearts and we're bringing our bodies into submission to a higher aim and a higher goal. And we enjoy God. We enjoy the people of God. We enjoy the inward sense of God. So it's a wonderful uh, way of, of speaking about this. Uh, Eugene Peterson, uh, who's uh, recently deceased, last three, four years, um, he wrote a book, and this is one of the most significant books for me, and it explains why I'm here uh, 21 years plus at um, Greenwich. Uh, Eugene Peterson, under the Unpredictable Plant, and Exploration in Vocational Holiness. It's, a, it's an extended reflection on the book of Jonah, who ran away, and he talks, it's, it's really a book directed primarily at ministers, but I think for the layperson who reads, you hear what we're supposed to be about, right? And so he's speaking to ministers how to cultivate a, a, a way of being a, a pastor, vocational holiness, how to be a in a holy, consecrated way. And he suggests, and he argues that pastors should stay where you are. It is way better for pastors to remain in one church than to flit about every two or three years, which is pretty common uh, for a lot of pastors, you know, kind of pastoral ambition, kind of climbing the, the career ladder as someone might in another uh, vocational area. So he comes at the disciplines pastorally. And it's interesting, the language he uses, spiritual reading, that's his version of meditation. It's called Lectio Divina. You read the scripture, and then you read the scripture again. This is in the same setting. And then you might read it a third time. And in, in, as you're reading it, you're, Lord, what, 
word are you saying to me through this? Not just reading the Bible, you know, reading my four chapters to get through my four chapters, but I'm, I'm really listening for God to speak to me through this word. So spiritual reading. He then talks about spiritual direction where we allow others to speak into our lives. A spiritual director, we sometimes use the word mentoring, but it's, it's more than that. It's different than that. A spiritual director is one who is trying to help another individual listen and pay attention to God. And so they listen and what are the circumstances? What are the events? What's going on in one's life? And the spiritual director asks these kinds of questions. I wonder what God is doing in the midst of this. Because it assumes God is involved always. And we forget that in our overwhelm and in our distress and in our anxiety and our frustration, we forget God attends us. Emmanuel, God is with us. So the spiritual director is the one who is helping another person to do that. So we need to have spiritual directors. We need to receive spiritual direction to submit our lives to others who we give permission to speak to us and ask us some hard questions, okay? So I love that. Spiritual reading, spiritual direction, meditation, um, you know, kind of taking the word inwardly, fasting, confession, okay? Bodily exercise. So Peterson identifies bodily exercise. Again, he's speaking a little bit to pastors here, but that we need to keep our bodies functioning well, and that that is part of a holy life, that my body is a gift, that I'm a steward of this body, and I need to keep this thing moving, that I might serve well, so that I, you know, in terms of just... I don't become sedentary. Now, obviously, as we get older, our exercise is going to change a little bit. But uh, he speaks to that Sabbath keeping. Wow. Willard doesn't talk about this. Foster doesn't talk specifically. But again, the challenge for pastors, again, he's, he's writing this somewhat to pastors, but it's true of, of congregants as well. We are commanded to keep Sabbath. We're not suggest, it's not suggested to keep Sabbath, right? And a lot, some early controversies that Jesus ran into were over Sabbath. The, the Pharisees thought he was not keeping Sabbath properly. By healing on the Sabbath, they said, you're doing work. And so God has given the Sabbath for man. You know, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That's part of the teaching of Jesus to rebuke or refute the Pharisees. Pastors are notoriously bad about that because we're working on Sunday, so it's hard for us to keep Sabbath that day. And so, but but often congregants as well. We live in a 24-7, 365 world. We're always wired. We're always connected. We're always able to respond. And so an e a work email may come through on the day of worship on Sunday. So Sabbath keeping is a discipline of just I, I lay aside my work. I trust God to be at work. You know, I don't, I don't fret and I'm not anxious and I'm not chasing the dollar. I'm not chasing status. You know, I, I, he talked about praying and playing as the two activities uh, for Sabbath keeping. You know, setting aside and then to pray, to engage God, and then to play. That is to take the elements of, of creation uh, and to enjoy them. Uh, retreats, and so pulling aside intentionally, either as an individual, as a small group, or collectively. And so that is a discipline to, to give ourselves space for greater attention to the Word of God, because in a retreat, you can take a topic and really go deep in the man matter of a couple days. A prayer retreat, you know, you can step aside and really soak something in prayer. Most of us don't do that, right? Most of us just live, 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 live younger kids, youth groups and college groups, you know, and young adult groups go on retreats. But as we get on in life, we often don't do that, but maybe we should, right? Uh, tithing. Thank you, Eugene. Almsgiving is another way of talking about this. The discipline of regularly offering to God from the fruit of our labor. The scripture has, it's clear, the scripture is clear that we are to do this, right? And so let us do it. That will discipline our 
attitude and relationship to money. It, our, our money, <laughs> financial lives, come under the lordship of Jesus. We submit ourselves here. Um, I think we, we did this some years ago when we were going into our building project. If everybody at Greenwich tithe, and this is not intended to be a pastoral rant at all, please. <clears throat> but, you know, living in Fauquier and, and Prince William counties as we do, median income, number of households, I forget what the exact figures were. But going back to, you know, 2009 and 10 when we kicked off our uh, building campaign, um, I think it was something like if we all tithe and gave 10% of our income, roughly it was, it was something like we'd have a $2.2 million budget every year. We wouldn't need a building project. I mean, we wouldn't need a building fund. We could just fund that out of our tithes, just giving 10% of our income. So I thought that was interesting. That, that still sits in my head. Um, dream interpretation. Boy, I'd never heard that before till Eugene, but, but we dream. And so part of it is we, we receive these dreams. And so, you know, clearly we read in scripture where God speaks through dreams many times to his people. And so this pastorally, Peterson says, is a discipline that you, you, you have a dream, you try to record it, and then you try to discern what is, is God speaking to me through this, perhaps in conversation with your spiritual director. Pilgrimage, intentionally going on a journey for the purpose of spiritual development. Okay, thinking of our lives as a pilgrimage. And so I kind of talk about that with these pilgrim psalms. Um, journaling is, you know, recording your thoughts, your, your, your reflections from study, from sermons, from life, from spiritual direction, insight, to, to capture this, that God is speaking to me through many means. And so I should capture that. And I'm off and on with journaling over the years. I'm glad for the journals I kept really young, uh, early on in my Christian life, because I look back and I just go, oh, I forgot all about that, which is why you journal. It's more than just a diary, dear diary. Journaling is a record of thoughts and reflections upon uh, God, upon God's word, upon the, the activities and experiences of one's life and submitting those. God, I wonder what you're doing here you know, capturing that in the journal. And then as you revisit that, you have a sense of, oh yes, this God who has watched over me and, and cared for me. And then he finishes with sabbaticals and small groups. Sabbaticals, intentionally stepping aside for a season. Again, this is written in the context of a book to pastors, but there's no reason others can't take a sabbatical. So don't just take a vacation, take a sabbatical. As you step aside, have a vacation with a purpose, right? So you you're resting deeply, <sighs> a deep rest from the work we do. And then being engaged in small group conversation and study um, where, where you're known a little more deeply than just the Sunday morning, how you doing with the pastor or the, the folks in the pew. So anyway, a, an interesting, a, another set of spiritual disciplines, again, that are to shape us into the image of Christ, to disciple us, to train us. Because you see that the, the Christian life and the, and the gospel are not something simply to be believed, absolutely believe the gospel. If you have never trusted Jesus Christ for your salvation, his death and resurrection, please do that today. And I don't know who's watching this at this moment. You know, this, this video may find its way to somebody who's never, uh, heard of Jesus or embraced Jesus or something like that. So trust Jesus. But the, the Christian life is more than just believing Jesus and then getting our little salvation ticket for heaven and then just living as I want. The Christian life is a truth not only to be believed, but to be lived. It is lived truth. And so these disciplines, these activities, these exercises help us to live the truth of Jesus Christ. So let's wrap up here, uh, close with prayer. We will pick up next week. We'll, I think we'll wrap up our Cultivating the Character of Christ set of reflections at the end of next week. So I've got a few more thoughts to tease out uh, with you all. Uh, and then we'll move on to a new topic, okay? Let, let, trust you have a good weekend. Hope to see you on Sunday. Let's pray. Father, thank you. <clears throat>
Oh, thank you for Richard Foster, for Eugene Peterson, and for their wise words. It seems so overwhelming to us to read the, the, the enormous number of activities and disciplines and exercises, but Lord, help us to take some small next step that we might find ourselves as disciples uh, on the way, that these activities, uh, either by ourselves or with others, would help to shape and, and fashion us and subdue us and to take our physical bodies and all that we are and direct them with greater focus and energy and attention towards you. And so watch over us this day and, and in coming days as we pray through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, may you know the accompanying presence of God through Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit as you make your pilgrimage this day and forevermore. Amen.